This is an introduction to Godot's GDScript for those of you with prior programming experience. So if you know your duck case and camel typing, you know, polymorphism, then let's get started. If you learn by example, this first part's for you. I'm just going to set up the code required to put this small game together where you click on the floor and generate colored balls with lights. This example is going to touch on a lot of things, so I made a, a list. Scene structure and composition, Godot documentation, Godot inheritance, the Godot classes with the most important functions, and event listeners or Godot signals, and access modifiers. If you want to skip straight to the syntax, look at the chapters below in the, in the details for the video. I've just put together a small project with a handful of nodes to give you an example. Just hitting this create new node button. I've got a spatial to be the root, a static body will serve as this floor, this rigid body will be, uh, I want to make like a light ball thingy majig. Uh, a rigid body needs a mesh and a collision shape. It doesn't need a light, but I'm adding the light. And I want the light, of course, to follow around the body, be stuck to it. So that's why it is a child of the rigid body and not my floor thing. Okay, we don't want that. Now, I haven't changed the names of any of these nodes. So if you want to recreate this or something for no reason, go ahead. One quick aside before I dig into this, all these things I've put together, they're called nodes. And if I right click any of them, go to the documentation, it will inherit from node. And this, this node class, boom, there's the treasure. This right here, required reading. This class has the most important functions uh, you'll be using in Godot. Stuff for traversing the scene tree, deleting, and so on. Let's start with where our code lives. In Godot, most of the scripts you make, they're going to inherit from Node. And for those Node inherited scripts to work, they're going to have to be in the scene tree somewhere. So we're tying our scripts to these nodes. The best location, the best real estate, if you will, will be the parent or the root of each scene. In Godot, of course, we're going to have you know a big scene for our level. And then we're going to cut up or divide our smaller game objects into their own scenes, like this light ball, I'll put that into its own scene later, and this floor should be its own scene. So where's the best place for code for this floor? On the static body, not on the mesh. Where's the best place for code for this rigid uh, little light ball? On the rigid body, not on the light thing down there. Where's the best place for this whole game level to have code? At the root, on the spatial. Let's start with our root node and add a script to that. I will hit attach script and give it a name. Uh, I'm thinking just level manager. And when we create a script this way, by right clicking and do attach script, it will automatically write for us what it extends or what it inherits. By creating a script this way, we really are creating a class. The class name keyword is hidden from us, but we can write it. Class name, I'll, I'll give this name level manager. We can only extend or inherit one thing. So if you hate multiple inheritancy, go dust for you. Also, take a moment to notice when you start to get crunched for space in your, in your coding environment here, there's an expand button that's going to make life much nicer. Now, remember, this is extending spatial, which, clicking into it, control clicking into it, uh, we see it inherits node. And any node needs to be in the scene tree to work. Later, I'll show you how to make some classes that don't need to be tied in to the scene tree. But first, let's just unlock the best and most important parts of Godot's built-in functionality. Let's find the methods and properties that are available to us in a script. It's all inheritance-based, right? So this script I just made extending spatial. If I just control click on the class name, I get to see the next layer down of what's available to me in properties and methods. And this spatial will become very familiar to you if you are making a 3D game. If you're making a 2D game, I'll make I'll add a node 2D and it, here's this documentation, uh, you will become very familiar with this. Either way, again, the real treasure, if you will, is in Node. Node has the most important functions, uh, arguably the most important functions, like add child uh, to the scene tree, get the parent of that node in the, in the scene tree, all the scene tree stuff, and also the deletion and ready functions, all these really important signals that you'll be using everywhere. All right, I want to give you three simple examples, putting some scripts together. So first notice, I can get to the scripts that I've already added. 
I copy and pasted some uh, camera code to have a camera that can move around. I can get back to the script I just made just by clicking this, or I can browse the scripts that are open here. You got to clear this out every so often, or you're just going to get uh, a headache. Starting here in this in this script at the root of my scene, I just want to keep track of uh, how many lights. So I'll write light count, and that'll be an int. I'll initialize it at well, there's one light, so one. Okay, that's good for this uppermost code. Let's go to this this floor. I want to add some more code to. I want to know if I'm clicking on the floor. So we'll put some code here. But first, I know that this should be its own scene. I'll right click this and hit Save Branch as Scene. I'll name it Basic Floor. Perfect. Saving that, I can now click into this new smaller scene and see what kind of thing we have. Okay, great. I'll right click on the uppermost one. Attach a script. I'll call this basic floor. Perfect. It inherits from static body. So if I want to find something for mouse clicks, let's control click into this first. Um, now it's going to have some signals or event listeners for me to, to look for and find, but I won't see all of them here. I will only see them for the static body. If I want to see the event listeners available for all these things it inherits, I'll click on the static body and go over to this tab here. Here I can see the event listeners available to me for each inherited class type. Node, object, remember, node, that's where the treasure is. Spatial, a lot of good stuff. And collision object, it has an input event. Ah, so if I want to detect mouse clicks on that floor, this is a good place to start. So I'll double click that and then I have a, a choice of uh, naming. And in Godot, there's no private public access modifiers. But when we have something that's going to be private-ish, we're going to prefix a function name or variable name with an underscore, just a convention, if you will. So I'll, I'll, say, I'll set this function name as floor input. Great, that's easy for me. I have to choose something. I have to choose a node here that has a script, or else setting up signals this way will not work. Now it's connected, and we can see we have a little green connection thing, and we get some uh, parameters being passed in. Position, event, and can I just write event period and get hints? Mm, no, it's not helping me. So what can I do? What, how can I find out what these things are? Google? No, no, don't freak out. I'm going to go back, click on static body again, and I'll see where this signal came from. This came from collision object. So if I go to back into my script, click down a static body, find that inherited collision object, look at that input event function, then I see, ah, there's the event. It is of class type input event. I click on that, bingo. Oh, wait, it just says it's generic and it's just a base class of everything. Oh, that's okay. Godot actually has good two-string functions for most of its classes. So let's just try printing it out. Let's, let's print out the event. Let's also print out the position. And those two things are going to print out a little bit differently. So I'll run and see what happens when I move my mouse around. OK, I'm seeing bottom left in my output. I got a vector 3 printed for the location. And it looks like it's printing out this, the class name for this input event. That's mouse motion. I guess I moved the mouse a little bit. Let's move it a little. Oh, there we go. Let's try some clicking. Aha. So when I click, that class name is input event mouse button. Great. I'm going to hit Alt F4, copy that. And to get hints, GDScript, this environment, needs to know what class it is. So we can do a simple test. If event is input event mouse button, then we will say print mouse button to test this out. We'll get rid of these other prints, get rid of that position, and let's just see if we've captured our mouse clicking. Good, I'm clicking and we got that button. Okay, now, now that I've, I've found this class, I've basically given myself a link to the documentation. Control, click. Aha, in the properties I see pressed. So I can go back and we'll 
we'll s check if it's pressed. Or uh, if it's not pressed, I think that would mean that the the mouse is going, uh, the button is going up. So let's let's do that. Let's say mouse pressed when pressed is opposite to try to find a click. Great. Okay. There's an example of how to figure this stuff out without just Googling and copying and pasting scripts. One more thing. I will check to, s to see if that parent of this, this floor node has a way to make a new light ball. And if it does, then do it. So we'll use a little reflection. Uh, we'll s get the parent and save it. Var p equals get parent, super important function from the node class. Then if p has method, um, we'll, we'll call it floor click. Then I will call it p floor click, and it will need just the position. Yeah. This is pretty much set up, so we just have one more example to look at. I'll go up back to my spatial node root, this whole game level root scene, and go to my rigid body, this light ball, because it also needs to be saved as a new scene. And this I will rename it as light ball, save it. I can click into the scene, go to the root, right, best real estate right at the top, right click, attach the script, and light ball would be the perfect name. And for this script, all I want to do is to be able to uh, set the color of this light ball when we make it. So it would be nice if uh, when, when this, when this uh, light ball is created to call the instructor. And in GDScript, the constructor is underscore in it. Uh, it would be nice if I could just get a color um, and then maybe set that color in here. My color, uh, which is a color. And then when we initialize self my color equals color, uh, this color. Uh, typical getter setter. We don't need the self. Just just for reference, we use self and not this for its own properties. Now this unfortunately won't work, but I'll show you. If we give this a class name of uh, what is this light ball, I can initialize it. I can go back to my spatial, this 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 um, this overarching node, and I can try to make one. Now that I've given that class a class name. I can do var lb for light ball and give it that class name, light ball. And we can do some typical new call, light ball new, and pass in that color. And now I can do color Rebecca purple. You're a lucky good old Rebecca. You got a color named after you. Now, I'll add it as a child and we'll see what happens. I still just only have one light ball. But if I go from local to remote to see the objects that are in the game live, I can go down, I see that light ball that exists, and here's the new thing I made. It is just a rigid body. I didn't get any of these children nodes added as well. So that's kind of a frustrating thing. When, when we're making a new version or when we're in, instantiating a script, it's not the same as instantiating a scene. So we don't really get to use our uh, constructor functions the way you might like to. So instead, I'll, I'll stop this. Uh, instead, for this, for this light ball script, I'll just make a setter function. Self my color equals color. Good. Last thing we'll do here is get rid of this ready function we're not using. And that's it. Uh, I've provided three simple examples. We've looked at the light ball this floor and the world, we've given them all scripts. Let me change these node names to give myself a little bit of clarity. Uh, and then what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to wrap this up by finishing the programming to make it so that when I click the floor, I'll make a new ball. So I'm not going to explain everything as I do this part, but I think by now you'll be able to follow along, which is great. Good for you. Now, <clears throat> let's do this. Floor. I know I already made the floor click. I asked for a floor click, click, even though it doesn't exist. So let's make it exist. And we know we need a position, which is a vector three. Great. 
Now, we're not just going to instance this class this way, because we actually need to instance the whole scene. How do we get it? We got to load it up for us. So we'll, we'll do LB scene, and we'll preload it. And where are you? Where are you? Yep, that's the, oh, the scene. We want this whole scene. Great. Then we'll make a new instance it, instance that scene. LB new will be that instanced. Great. Then we'll take that position. We'll set it. So that's LB trans translation equals position. But if we're clicking on the floor, the Y will be zero. Uh, so it'll be like halfway in the floor. So let's up that a little bit. Um, get that variable name right. Translation y plus equals 1. And then once that's set, we can actually throw this into our scene at child lb no. So this, I think, should work, even though we're not setting the color yet. Let's just make sure. Remember, write a little, test a little. OK, good, 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 good. Now, what would be next? Next would be setting the color. OK. So we can we still have access to that variable. We'll do lb set color and let's do uh, let's let's make a color out of three randoms. Let's do var color and we can we can do a color with um, three random floats zero to one. This guy copy paste 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 and then set that color to this and then let's see if that works. Mm -hmm. Oh, that didn't work because set color does not exist in rigid body. So it says a non-existent function set. We got an error. Let's let's see what it did for us. It, it gave us a little arrow to show us where, which is nice. It pulled up this insta instantiated class, which is nice, and we can see. Yeah, we do have uh, color. Cool for this from this from this function. Now. If I if I take this away, I mean it's telling me set color is not there, but I get hints for set color. So I think what I did was I messed up the inst initialize function. Uh, here, when we're creating this light ball, we are passing something in. Uh, so let's get rid of that and try again. So when we're ready, don't do anything here. Let me go back to the uh, light ball and get rid of this initialize thing. Right, that constructor. We don't really have access to it anyway because we are loading an entire scene. Great. Now we can go back here to our top dog and try that again. Come on. Great. Now it's calling that function, but that function just saved a color vari variable. Didn't actually put it to any use. So let's go do that real quick. We'll just get rid of that variable in this light bulb thing. We don't need to set it this way. We need to get to its children. So uh, mesh instance thank you and that's the first child of this little scene and then the the omni light the light which is an omni light that is the what is this zero one two second child of this scene now what can i do i want to get the spatial match i need to get the material and that is a spatial material i know because i set this up a little bit earlier and I'm going to get, the, get that from the mesh. Get, uh, let's see, surface material, the first one on there. And then the light, I can just set directly. Light, something with color. Light color. Set that equal to the color I'm setting. And the mesh is emitting, or the spatial material, I should say, is emitting. So can I get emission? Emission what? We've got emission color. What is this? What is emission? Is that a? I can control click to see what it is. Yes, it is the emitted light's color. Great. I'll set that as color as well. And then this should work. Let's go back. OK. And it should be this random color. Mm. Oh, OK. Well, they all have this. It, the color is getting changed for all of them. So let's go back into that um, rigid body, go to the mesh. I will find its material. And go down at the resource, I'll make it local to scene. Great. Let's see if that works. Uh, 
Yep, that is what I want. Almost done. I want to keep the, keep them a little bit more blue. So I'm going to make red just go from 0, 0 0.3, and the same with green. And then blue can be higher. And then I didn't increment my light count. So when we make a new light ball, I'll do light count plus equals 1. And I also just want to stack these guys up. So each 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 y will also add that light count. So I'll make the first one at y equals one, then two, then three. Then the last thing that's kind of annoying me is uh, the these light balls are blocking my clicks. So I can go to this, and I should be able to go input and uncheck ray pickable, and then my click casts should go directly through. Let's try that, and then and then we'll be done. There, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm having more fun now. And that's what I want. Let's see how fast I can click. Yeah, make it rain. Sorry, that was a little loud. Make it rain. Cool, great. Ah, beautiful. All right, next let's make some standalone classes. A class that doesn't have to be in the scene tree to actually work. Let's right click on res, hit new script. What do we get? Create script, language D script, of course. Inherits node. So it assumes we want a node, but a node, of course, needs to be with the other nodes in the scene tree. So we don't want that, but for now, let's leave it be. For a path, I'll give it a name. I want to make a light bulb manager, so I'll name it that. When I create it, the first thing I'll do really quick is give it that class name. Class name, light bulb manager, and it extends node. Now let's delete that extends node. What happens if you delete it? It will default to not being a node. It will be, de be defaulting to being a reference. Let's look at reference. Control click on reference. Reference is great. It's going to be pretty much just what you want for your own classes. If you go down one layer lower to object, you're going to have to deal with memory allocation on your own. So I will stick with reference. When the thing goes out of scope, it'll get cleaned up for me. That's just what I want. Now I'm going to take three seconds and move that code that was in my game right into this class and instance the class. All right. Goodbye, goodbye. Um, this will go over here. Boom, 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 boom. This ready function, not going to need it. It's not going to be part of a node, not going to get called. Great, just like this, and it works. When this game node, my, my root node is ready, it'll instance the class I made, and that'll unlock the functionality that I wanted to divide or organize into that class. Mission ac accomplished, ac All right, I'm gonna switch over to my other project, and we're gonna start going through the scripting basics. Let's start with variable declaration. Uh, it starts with the word var. What do you think that stands for? Variant, which is their base class. It's like um, it's JavaScript, you know, a, a container to hold any kind of variable. Var, variable name, um, n, equal sign, whatever you want. Now, as an afterthought, you can put in the type. This will be an int. And it really is like an afterthought. And by the time you watch this video, hopefully this will actually increase performance. So you have all the standard data types you would expect. Um, we've got our floats. You have your strings. Whoops, don't use name though, because that's built in already for each node. You have your dictionary, which is a uh, hash map. You have your uh, array, which, of course, you can just put anything in there. Also, we have to have our bools, right? There's your boilerplate basic primitives you're going to use all the time. We can also take some of these variables and export them using the export keyword uh, so that we can edit them like so. I'll click on that node that has that script, and then you can see on the right, script variables, we have an n. And I can give this export some hints. I can say this should be an int, and I want to limit it from 0 to 20. And this, and this 
do, uh, setting equal to four will be like a default value after we do this. I click on that again, and I'll try to do 404,000, and it'll say no. You max it out at 20. There's a lot more examples on how to do this in the in the uh, documentation online. There's also a way to use a keyword set get to specify setters and getters for your uh, member variables here, uh, but it's gross and we're not going to cover it. What about switching between types? Uh, Go dot script also made it really easy. I'll make a J, but I know that's actually going to be a float version of N, so I can just write float N. I can go the other way around, or I could just turn anything into a string. Uh, var stuff s for for string, I guess. String, and then I'll put those that array in there. And then when I make, I'll make a box and put that string in there, and just make sure that this works. Easy, good. So you can expect a lot of things have really good two string functions already set, and what else do we even need here? I could do an, an int one for np for no problem, which would be an int, and we can just take the int of that i float at the top. Very easy. When you declare a variable and you want to keep or set or define its type like this, there is also a shortcut. You can remove this variable type, and the Goda engine will determine based on what the uh, literal is on what type it should be. So if I write now down here i equals something else as a string, I should get an error. Otherwise, remember, if I am just doing this, then I can change n to something else. Here it would be a uh, string. What's next? Functions. Let's declare some functions. Uh, a function Remember, there's no private or public access modifier, so if you want it to be private-ish, to give yourself a reminder not to call it uh, from outside, you can use an underscore to remind yourself. Do something. Parameters, you can just write a, a variable name. Uh, and it doesn't. you don't even need to specify the type. It'll just be a variant. It could be a string or whatever. Uh, then, if you, I mean, if you want, you could say, if a thing is string, print a thing. There's, wow, there's like all the programming knowledge you need for Go. Now the return type can be set like this. So we'll say this returns a, uh, it returns a string and then it'll throw you an error if you didn't return anything. Let's return nothing. Great. Now you can also, uh, if you want to be more clear about the input parameters, you can also declare what type they should be. So we'll say this should be an int. All right, so then this this line should be good. Have an error for us, and it does. A value of type int will never be a type of type string. I can also set a default value to these uh, parameters. I could say this a thing default value will be um, nothing as well. And if you're like me and you're used to lower level programming languages, you might not think of any good places where you can just take use of make good use of this variant data type. I'll give you an example. So this box I just had. Uh, I, I I set a pop message, and this who knows what was getting passed through. It could be a vector, it could be an array. So I I don't want to make ten different functions taking in ten different data types. I'll just take in the variant. The message here I can default it to pop. If message just means if that thing is not null, then if it's not if it's not a string, then I can just use that two string function to turn whatever it is into a string, which works pretty much all the time. Uh, set the pop message and I'm done. Right? Thank you, variants. You're wonderful. Now with this function, I've made a box, but I want a helper function that can just check if a box is out of bounds. Right? This, this floor is only so big. So this is a good place for a static function to come in. It will not be able to access any member variables or member functions that are not also static. Right? So that can help me out and then I can I can use it inside the class how I see fit, just adding the static keyword. In your scripts, there's going to be a few really important functions that are common to all scripts. So let's look at them. I'll I'll make a new child node. I'll just call it spatial. I'll add a script to it. Two of those really important functions, well, they are already visible. We have ready and process. And process is commented out because you don't want to uncommented out unless you're going to use it, because this is happening 
every frame, right? It's going to take up some uh, computational power. What are the other ones, and where can we find them? We can control click into spatial, see the spatial documentation, but what we really want, where the treasure is, is in node. So we we'll click on that. Bingo. Here's a lot, no, all of the super important functions. So I'm going to choose the ones I use all the time. Okay. Input. I use that all the time. Let's, let's override that. Funk input event. For now, just pass. Let's see what else we got. I know one that I use a lot is the physics process. Okay, let's get that right there. Can, let's get that in there. We'll put it under process, physics process. For now, just pass. Any others? Let's look. Uh, here's enter tree. I never use that, but uh, let's, let's throw it in there and see, see what it does. I, the one I usually use is the built-in initializer or the constructor func init. Okay, we'll see what that does too, but for now, pass. Let's see, I think six is good. You know, I don't want to overload you with um, too many of these really important functions, but these, these are already the most important ones. Now, for these first four, I replace that pass with just a print statement so we can see what order they go in. And this input one kind of should be down there. It doesn't really fit in this first group. So I'll hit play and see what happens. Okay, we have initialize first, then enter the tree, then it was ready. And as soon as I start moving my mouse, we're getting input events. Cool. Now these last two, process, this will happen every frame. And the physics process will ha happen, or it will be called every physics frame. So these are the two where you need to be the most careful putting code. Ideally, if you need to, just have some math in here, but avoid a bunch of if-else statements. Now if you're used to game engines, you might recognize this delta, and that's going to be the time passed since the last frame. So this variable is going to be used a lot to normalize a speed or something like that. I will change this to be, uh, we'll say print, and we'll, we'll just print out um, something. Now, what, what might happen is you might end up with too much stuff. Actually, you know, I'll just write process. You might end up with too much stuff inside these functions. And it might be um, really, really killing your... Okay, so you can see, <laughs> we can see they're on two different threads, and they are just going nuts. So. What happens if you get too much logic in here and it's slowing down your game? Well, in some other place, you could decide whether or not this needs to be enabled. So you could say self set process false. And self, of course, you don't really need that, right? So you could turn it off, right? Let's try this. When it's ready, print ready, then set process false. And let's see if it has a bunch of stuff printing out. It still has the physics process. Interesting. All right, so let's see if we can turn that off. Set physics process. False. Okay, so then you can manually control when this is active, right? And then if something, usually when it's active, takes up too much processing power, you can turn it off, right? And when it comes back into use, you can turn it back on. At some point later, of course, you might want to delete this node. And how would you do that? Well, you could use free, but that's technically the less safe route. So what you usually want to write is Q free. So What's happening when we're ready? We're printing ready, we're setting these processings to false, and then we are queuing free. So now we can try out that other overloadable one that is also pretty useful, exit tree. So we should see it print exit tree before it gets deleted. Let's see. Good, we got it. Bottom left, exit tree. Now this is a game engine, so there's a few coding things that exist here and not other places. The first thing we're going to have to pay attention close to is just getting our, our hands on other nodes. So if I'm in this world node, and that's where my script is, let's say I want to get hold of this uh, screen text thing I've made so that I can throw some text up on the screen. So we can do that when the ready function is called. I can, uh, well, I'll save a reference to it, uh, and I'll just call this screen text. And I think I gave this screen text a class name. Good. So I can hold. I can put that in here as well. This is screen text of type screen text. Now, when we are ready, we can look for it. We could say screen text equals get node screen text. Okay, just like that. Now, there is an alternative for now. Uh, you can just do dollar sign, type in screen text, and that is basically the same thing. That's exactly the same thing. But to me, this looks more like programming, so I like this more. I mean, why, why confuse people that are, are not really fluent in GDScript yet? Now, alternatively, I could have just said,
get child, and then which child of is it of this world? It's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, number six, no, not one, six. Or I could iterate through all of them for C, for child, in get children. Then I could just check for that class name I gave to the class. If C is screen text, then screen text can be saved there. And then I can break, right? I found it. Now I can use this screen text. I could do, uh, let's see, set middle or upper text. And what will I say? I'll say uh, hello and welcome. Run that. Great. Now, having too much of this code to find children or different nodes in your ready function kit and get a little crowded. So, alternatively, up here we can just write on ready var screen text of type screen text equals get child six. We could do this, or we could we could uh, probably preferably just write get node and then what is the name of that node? It's screen text. Then I don't need this. I can just print stuff when it's ready, when that node is ready. Hello and welcome. Wonderful. Else if has been shortened to elif, but everything else is about exactly what you'd expect for if else. So let's read this. Function, is dad angry? I need to know his face color, whether or not he's sweaty, whether or not he's drunk, and I'm returning a bool, right? True or false. If the face color is red, if he's dr uh, not drunk and sweaty, then yes. Else if he's drunk and not sweaty, true. Else, in this case, and what would this case be? Um, not drunk and sweaty. Okay, false. Else, return false. So if the face color is not red, false. You can also chunk everything together on one line like this. Although this one would be exactly the same here. Var dad is angry, angry, that is true. If not sweaty and face color is red. Else, false. Next, let's do some iteration. So I will make a array for a bunch of boxes. And then the first thing would be a simple for loop. Uh, and in GD script, I'll type it like this. For i in range of, and then how many times do I want to do this? I want to do this 30 times. And I will uh, create a new box and push it into my array, which is more like a list array from from other languages. I will push it into the back. Okay, so, and I can use this i, so I can throw this i, for example, in a, in a y if I want to put the box set. And of course, this will go from 0 to um, 29, right? Okay, good. Now, for boxes, this is an array, and of course, we have some easy ways to iterate through an array. We can say for box in boxes, now this array, we don't have typed arrays, so it doesn't know that this is of data type box. So for a shortcut for now, I can just say if box is box, that will check against the data type. Then I can do something like, oh, what, what am I going to do? Oh, I'll set the, uh, I'll set auto pop to be, to be what? I, now I don't have a iterator, right? I don't have 0 to 29. I just have this. All right, so this is a shortcut if you don't need this i iterator. But I want it, so I'm going to rewrite this uh, for i in range boxes size. Now this will be a little bit different, right? If boxes i is box boxes i set auto pop to i we'll say three plus i times zero point one. And that should uh, that should work. I should be able to iterate through all those boxes, set an auto pop, um, just like that. Wonderful. Here I'll throw a while loop onto this. Uh, not a great example, but whatever. While loops are in there. While n is less than the box size, I'll get one box out of my array of boxes. And what can we do it? What can we do with it? We can set a pop force, and let's make it like thirty. Great. That should work. I should iterate through all those boxes and make the force with which it pops much greater. Hey, look, they're kind of flying. Hey, cool. All right. Let's switch from an array to a dictionary and make sure we can iterate through that. So this should be the same. 
uh, except this boxes, how will we put that in there? Let's just use the I, the iterator, as the key. So we'll say boxes I equals B. Great. Now, later, how can we iterate through that? For key in boxes. Okay, and then I can say boxes key. Um, well, I know that this is a box, right? So I can say var B box equals boxes key, and then I will get the hints for a box. I can do add, what can I do? I can add a light bulb to this box. Let's go with Rebecca, Rebecca purple, and that should work. Mm -hmm. Great, light balls in there, wonderful. Next, let's see if we can't use a simple switch case to divide these boxes up to four different colors. So I know that this key is going to be from what? 0 to 29. Okay. So I'll do var n equals key modulus 4. So this n should be from 0 to 3. So now let's do our switch case. So we have to write match instead of switch. And then instead of writing case, we just write the case. So 1, um, it'll be b for the box, mm, add, and then what color? Orange, great. So I'll set up the rest of these. Then default will be a underscore. We'll have it just be white. Let's try that. Of course, default shouldn't have gotten hit, so there should be no white balls. Good. Next, class declaration. Let's start with some inner classes. Now, remember, each of these files, each time you make a new script, this is a class. All these functions that are defined, whatever, that's all going to be part of a class. And if you want to give it a class name, right, there you go. Class name, whatever. And this is great, right, because I can then test in some other code whether or not something is of this class name. This is basically, uh, Godot will make this globally accessible. But let's start with inner classes. Let's just say for this create box, I'm adding a light bulb to the box and I'm calling this function in it. Maybe I just want to make a, a class for that, make it a little bit easier. I can write class colored box. Then what's in there? Well, I'll, I'll have an initialization uh, or a constructor. So that'll be func in it and I'll take in a color. I'll say color that is color and then I can use, oh, and, and of course, I'll need the reference to that box I made, right? Box. Good. Then I can say B, add light ball to box, and just use that color. Now, let's try that. Um, var CB for colored box equals colored box, new. And then I can pass in the box and the color. And I want color brown. Okay, let's see if that works. Oh, well, you, you would have no way of knowing, right? Because I, I added that light bulb there. Oh, but we saw it. There are two. Okay. So even though I called that function twice, it looked like it worked. Great. Now, with classes, if I go into my box script, you know, which has a lot of code, and at the very top, class name box, can I use this? Let's try. Let's see what happens. var b equals box new. And then I think, well, I need to add this to my scene, right? So I'll do add child B. What will happen? I got the box that was at 000, zero, zero but hmm, nothing else. Now let's look at remote, see what's in here. I have, I have those box sides. I have, no, I have nothing. Why? Why do I have nothing? Well, this box extends rigid body, but I am not, no, I am not loading up the entire scene, right? I am not loading the scene for the box. So calling box new will not load the scene. So how did I actually load up this box? What was the code involved? I'll show you. Preload this, I have to preload the scene first, define this function, instance the scene, set the translation I want, and then add it as a child, and then I can return box as a reference and use it as I want to. Now, of course, you can make your own inheritance-based structure of code. You can go nuts, but by default, what's happening? If I throw code on this box, 
sure, I'll have my class name box, but it's by default going to extend this rigid body because what I'm working on here, what I'm making is the Godot's rigid body. So usually what you're doing is building off of a built-in Godot type. All right, let me switch back to this project where we just, you know, we can click on the floor and make some colorful balls. Now, let's say this camera is also going to serve as my player, and I also want to throw on another script besides this one that just lets me move the camera around. You might be tempted to be like, well, here, I mean, here's the problem, right? This can only have one script. So you might be tempted to add a node, add a spatial, and then add another script. You know, that's, you know, you know no, no. Okay, you don't need to do that. We're not going to do that. So what we're going to do instead is throw in here a script that doesn't need to be attached to a node. Okay, so how can we do that? We'll go in our resolution, just do new script. And what will this be called? This will be called, I don't know, let's do player health system. And it will not inherit from node, but we'll just change it in here. Let's go player health. And let's just get rid of this and see what happens. Let's throw on a class name, class name uh, HP system. And then Let's also throw in a constructor, right? We'll actually, we will actually get to use this instructor or constructor because this is not going to be in the, in the scene, right? It's not going to be on the top of a scene. And how will we initialize this? Let's do, um, yeah, max HP, which we will require a float, and we'll save this up here. Great, now we have a constructor, and it will set some value. Now we can go back to our, our camera, which we also want to serve as our player script. And when this is ready, hey, let's let's load up that thing. So let's let's save our thing. What do, what do we have? We have an HP system. And now we know what data type it is, right? It's an HP system. And when we're ready, we can say HP system equals HP system new. And we can throw in the, uh, the number. Let's see, we want maximum. 200 HP. Okay, will this work? Yes, it'll work. Great. Now, let's print out that health, make sure it actually worked. Let's go back to player health, print that, and let's see uh, what it is. Let's see um, if self is, because I think it's a reference. Print, I am a reference. Great. Let's see if that works. Oh, okay, so it is. It tells me that it is a reference. So by default, if you're not telling this class what it extends, it will extend reference, okay? And reference is exactly what you want if you want a node that doesn't have to be in the scene tree. Okay, so then I could put all my HP-related functions here. I would have to pass down some input events, but that's not a big deal, and you're done. Event listeners in Godot are called signals, and here I'm starting with a box. Let's make it so that uh, something happens when I detect that it's leaving the game. So I will write B for this box, and I can connect a signal, basically connecting two functions, with the connect function. So I will look for not body entered, but let's see, I want to say tree exiting. So when it's getting deleted, this, this will get uh, called and the signal will uh, be emitted. Now, what am I? Con it needs a target. Where am I connecting this to? So it'll be self, the same script, and then I'll need to make a function for something to happen, right? So I'm going to call it the function I will make, spam box, and then I can give it an array of parameters to pass through. So it needs to be a, uh, it needs to be an array, and for now we'll just put b in there, this box, so that when it's exiting. I'll get a reference to it to be able to get its location so I can make a new box at that location. So then I need to define this function. It's func spam box. It takes in um, a box. Now I will, I will take and save the location of those things really quick. Good, once I have that, then I can do this, uh, make a new box, var b2 equals create box at that x, y, z, and then b2, I'll do the same thing. I will connect when it's leaving, and when it, when it leaves, I will spam a box again. So let's see if this works. Good, okay, we'll move in, we'll move in. <laughs> Good, oh boy, that was a lot of, uh, okay, cool. That's fun to watch. And one more time. All right, computer, don't die.
<laughs> cool. Now, different nodes, they're going to have different signals attached to them. And the fastest way to find them all is not through documentation, but just clicking on the node and then going up over to the right side and switching from inspector to node, okay? And then for mesh, sure, we got those. But for this uh, rigid body, we've got plenty. And it looks like under box, I've defined two of my own, right? One for when the box pops and I, and I pass some data through, and one for when the oxygen changed uh, because, you know, something in there might be breathing. <laughs> so how did I define those signals? Oh, they're just like this, right? You write signal, name of the signal, any data that that thing's going to pass through. Okay, and then I could use that in other places. With signals declared, then it's up to you somewhere in your code to define when they get emitted. So let's see, here's, here's where I emitted this one. When I'm setting the box oxygen, I will emit a signal that it changed. Okay? Uh, I'm just writing, a, you just need a string of the name and the uh, variable to be passed through it. Okay, there's one more, right? Box popping, right? And it will look exactly the same. When, my, when I call pop open box, I'm also emitting a signal so that anyone listening will know about it. And I'm passing along some data in case, uh, in case you needed some of that data. So now if I don't want to connect th signals through code, I can also do it through this uh, interface. But I'm going to need to connect it to another script or this script itself. I don't really have anything that needs to know about the oxygen changing, so let me find something that does. How about this cute little chippy? Oh, not skull, this chippy. Okay, so I'll throw this chippy in the scene. And this guy, he's going to need to know if there's any oxygen left. So what do we do? We double click on oxygen changed, go to baby, click on baby, and then we can have a cop, uh, receiver method already uh, in on our clipboard, and we could just paste it in. Or we could just change this one. Okay, And I will make it on box oxygen changed. That's fine. And now I'll, I'll be able to do something in the baby script. Now this baby already had a script, this chippy already had a script, so this is just going into it as well. If Now I can use this variable too that's getting passed in. If oxygen amount is less than one, I don't know, we can uh, die, do we have a die? No, uh, but I guess the die thing is somewhere else. Anyway, that's how you connect it through this interface. So here's an example of where you might use that, right? I might create a box, throw a chippy in that box, and then, you know, Set the, set the box to have 60% helium. Now it's not going to float much because Shippy's in there, but I can check on that oxygen changing, right? While he's breathing, he might be sucking that oxygen up and then see, when that oxygen gets low, he might try to, <laughs> we might want to call some function to make it like bounce around. Ooh, yeah, oh, he might be close to death if he's jumping that high. Oh, good, we saved him just in time. <laughs> and we are done. Okay, I hope Hope this has helped you, uh, other programmers, or even those of you with some programming experience. I hope this helped uh, someone. So <laughs> let me leave you with some an animation, I guess. I guess. My favorite part of making this GD script introduction by far was this uh, infinite box thing. So let's call this Pandora's box, and let's let it rip.